हे वासुदेवया सो द topic that i was given social anxiety i think when i was of course given this we're not just talking about feeling a little bit shy but actually experiencing um huge amounts of stress when we have to go into social kind of environments so there is a a formal definition and they define it as as actually a disorder and they say individuals with social anxiety disorder fear negative evaluations from other people this is not the only thing but this is actually one of the big drivers and they state that one of the significant characteristics of this disorder is an overwhelming fear of humiliation it's unfortunately becoming increasingly pronounced such types of anxiety in society i mean it's it's totally amazing mankind has been around for thousands of years and undergone severe challenges you know wars constant wars fighting over territory different forms of exploitation weather events that lead to starvation and famine different types of diseases and things so it's not like there's been a shortage of enormous difficulties that people have faced but compared to what humanity has gone through in the last hundreds and thousands of years today is pretty lightweight i mean it's been a long time since there's been a serious war i don't think anybody has ever encountered a famine or diseases that just wipe out big parts of the population yet we find that there is this growing anxiety and depression and even suicidal thought it it's grown dramatically in the last 20 years and more specifically in about the last 6 to 8 years it's kind of like going up one of the problems that we we face are, are these things you know this creates such an enormous illusion that i'm actually communicating with others when i can be just sitting at home and actually not dealing with anything anybody like one of the things that they've found with young people that would spend a lot of time you know from a quite an early age on these devices one of their characteristics is when they engage with other people they have a hard time looking at others in the eyes everybody 
talks with their head down or, or a lot of people. They won't really look. There is this, this fearfulness of engaging. Yet, part of our deep nature is that we are social. To have relationship and particularly to love is like such a, an important part of our deeper, even spiritual identity. And so when we have difficulty in these kind of areas, it's, it's really, really sad and it's really un, unfortunate. So while, you know, discussion about social anxiety may be rising and may be more common now, it's not like it's something new. You know who Hippocrates is? The ancient, ancient Greek philosopher? 400 years BC, he observed this condition and he wrote about it. He stated that such a person dare not come into company for fear he should be misused, disgraced, overshoot himself in gesture or speeches, or be sick. He thinks every other person is observing them. So this is the, you know, one of the big, the big features and the big characteristics. So we can categorize it as, as fundamentally a form of extreme self-consciousness. And I'll, I'll come back to that word in, in a little bit. Tonight, we actually don't want to get into diagnosing anybody. I am, I am not a qualified medical professional. We're not going to get into d discussing how things are diagnosed, nor are we going to talk about conventional treatments of the condition. What I'm going to do is offer another perspective. Um, this perspective that I will offer is founded on deep spiritual principles. And I think people will generally find it really helpful in the way that someone might process or deal with or address this condition. So in order to get started, I think it's, it's important that we understand something. We, we live in a time that's categorized or, or epitomized by the selfie. Everybody's taking pictures of everything. Even your food. People can't just sit down and eat a meal. They have to take a picture of it. They have a saying. I don't know if you do it in New Zealand, but other parts of the world, they have a saying, the phone eats first. <laughs> and it's kind of like, what are you doing? You know, and of course, it has a lot to do with trying to project to the world how cool I am, how happy I am, how wonderful my life is. You know, we, we, we have this unfortunate feeling that, that other people have to validate everything that we're doing. And it's just like, what? <laughs> no, you don't need validation from anybody. You can do whatever you want to do. Other people may agree or disagree. That's okay. You're, you're entitled. You have that freedom, that freedom of choice. But when we set ourselves up to be constantly scrutinized, 
like I'm always trying to look a certain way. I mean, the selfie thing is ridiculous. How many shots do I have to take before I can get one that I will post? <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, what are you doing? You're not showing a natural picture of you. You're trying to show the most artificial one that you had to work really hard to, to get just right and the right angle. And this, I look better this way than, than this way. And, you know, it, it's kind of like, oh, this, this is a sad situation when we really feel that we need to be constantly validated and endorsed. And then the idea that how I look, what my body looks like, is going to determine how acceptable I am to others, how desirable or lovable I will be, is going to be based on physical appearance. It's like, oh my God, that's so pitiful and so shallow. What have we come to? This has not happened accidentally. It's just part of the direction that society has taken. So the commonly held idea is that our physical bodies and our state of mind, these are our actual identities. My physical body and my state of mind, these are, this is my identity. Um, you know, this, I, this idea that this is who we truly are. Well, I'm going to say that th that is not true. There is another way of looking at things. There is another. This paradigm is, is actually is, a, is the foundation for much unhappiness and much distress. Since the most ancient of times, there has been a teaching, a yogic principle, that the body and the mind is not who you are. That within this outer garment, there is an eternal spiritual being. Last time I was here a couple of weeks ago, um, the topic was, we all know we have a soul, but what is it? So one of the things I tried to establish early on is you don't have a soul. You are the soul. That's an extraordinary idea because we actually don't know who we are in the deepest part of ourself. Who am I truly? In Sanskrit, the word that describes me is this word Atma. The word Atma, it literally means the self. And so what, what is happening is that in the normal course of life, everybody has become overwhelmed, identifying with all of the labels attached to the body that we currently have. I am male, I am female, I am young, I am old, I am tall, I am short, I am thin, I am fat. All of these labels, and I hold them very close to me and say, this is who I am. But the reality is, no, that, that is not true. The body is constantly changing. The body that you're wearing now, two years ago, 
98% of all the atomic particles making up your current body, they, they weren't part of, of your body. Your body was made up of other atomic particles. Within five years, every single atom in the body has been replaced. You, your body is constantly undergoing change. You have a time when you we have, maybe have a picture of a, of a young baby, your baby body, and you go, that's me. And then a childhood body, that's me. Yeah, but it, isn't the body different? Yeah, but it, it just grew. No, it's more than that. That's actually a completely different body. <laughs> All of the components have changed. This is like a shocking idea. But all throughout, there is a one single person who is experiencing these changes. Your identity has remained constant. You have experienced these different bodies and these different changes. The cultivation of the appreciation of our spiritual identity is the single most important thing that you can actually do in this life. It is this that is the doorway to complete freedom, liberation from all the anxiousness and all of the difficulty that comes with dealing with, with the body. Um, Along with that, the great teachers in the yoga system, they also taught that you are actually not the mind, that the mind is also covering you. And that's just like, what? <laughs> really? We can try to control our mind. You know, if you have some fear or some anxiousness or you want to focus on schoolwork or some work that you're doing or you're trying to remember something, you know, for a business deal and, and you experience in all those situations that you are using your mind trying to control it, trying to make it remember, trying to do things with it. If you were your mind, you couldn't step back like that and, and do that. And so the mind, which is the repository of all of our experience in this world, the place where all the emotions reside and manifest. To learn that I am actually not the mind. You know, these meditation, the guided meditation that um, you went through in the beginning. I think over time they will, you can attend the classes here and be introduced to different experiences of these mindful type meditations. In, in doing them, it grows your awareness of the fact that this body is something that I am occupying and using. And similarly, my mind should be something that I am using rather than being used by. They have a teaching that the mind can be the greatest friend or the greatest enemy. That's an extraordinary idea. Your own mind if it is uncontrolled, can actually be a great enemy. And we know this when we become 
overly emotional. Like, particularly anger is one I always like to talk about when a person becomes overwhelmed by anger. You end up saying things and doing things that don't make your life better, they make your life worse. You end up saying things and doing things that you later will regret. Maybe you won't admit it, but if you are actually open to thinking about it, it's not good. You haven't improved your life. There are other options for dealing with things other than anger. Anger is just blind. Particularly when it, you know, it's like blind rage, when it, people just lose it and they, they don't care what the outcome is going to be. So this, these spiritual practices where we endeavor to cultivate an increasing awareness of who we truly are within our heart of hearts, the spiritual being, the spiritual being that will continue to exist even after death. Death is not experienced by the soul or the spiritual being. It is something that occurs to the body. When you, the person, leaves that body, that body now manifests its true character. It's just like you know, a not very attractive hunk of flesh and bones and all other kinds of biological waste. You don't really want to be involved with it, with a, with a dead body. You have a natural feeling of being a little bit repulsed, even when it's somebody that you love and care about. And that's not bad. That is good. Because it is a little window into something really, really important. And that is the eternal spiritual nature of the person who resides within this vessel, within this, this covering. So we live in, a, in an era, era where it's become increasingly pronounced that people are, are told, there's this constant message, the body is you. And you need to spend this money and dress it like this. You need to, if necessary, even undergo operations or to take certain types of chemicals to sort of increase the attractiveness of this body and who you are. You know, I, I, I use the term earlier, you know, extreme self-consciousness in talking about social anxiety. The problem with that term, extreme self-consciousness, is that I am mistakenly thinking of the body as being the self. And I'm so worried about how awkward I might be and what I look like and maybe the way I speak and how I'm dressed and how the body is going to act and do things. And I'm, I'm just like so concerned and, 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 and overwhelmed by it. I'm worried that I won't say the right things, that I won't behave in a way that other people will adulate and, oh, you're so amazing, you're fantastic. I get really, really caught up in these things. And there is a reason for it. There is a interesting documentarian. Um, his name is Adam Curtis. He did a four-part BBC documentary called The Century of the Self. And he said that 
what he was exploring was the rise of an idea that has come to dominate our society. It is the belief that satisfaction of individual feelings and desires is our highest priority. The problem is that when people pursue a path that is very self-centered, but in a wrong way, then we begin to struggle with true relationships, meaningful relationships, because we are not looking at the person. You know, there's this one woman, what was her name? Stephanie something, I can't remember. She, she, had a, she was with her husband and on his birthday. He, they had taken this flight with their friends. And the plane on the way back had, had landed at a small airport and refueled. And when they were trying to take off, the plane crashed. And it was full of fuel. And so like on 92% of her body, she had third degree burns. And she had, she said she could smell the flesh burning. She could smell the hair burning. You know, it was like so traumatic. You're breathing fire in to your lungs and you're scorched all inside. They put her into a coma. They kept her in a coma for six months because she was so disfigured and, 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 and it's just amazing that the body was able to continue to keep going, that she was able to continue to live in that state. So after six months of all this, they kept her in a coma because they had to do all these really painful skin grafts to try and restore some normalcy. But it's like her face is all melted and everything. And she was a mother of four children or three at that time. And she loved her kids more than anything. And the husband was a really nice guy. I saw them being interviewed. He was badly burned also. They're really, really nice people. And when after six months, they were going to allow the children in to see her for the first time. And she was really freaked out because she couldn't even look in a mirror. Things were so bad. And when her first and eldest daughter, who at the time was about five, came into the room, and when she saw her mother, it's like, it's like she'd seen a monster and she's recoiling. And she's saying to her daughter, it's, it's me, it's mummy. It's, I'm still your mummy. It's me. Don't be afraid. It's, it's me, your mummy. But all the while, the daughter's like, yeah. And we can't imagine how painful that is for her to have that kind of experience. Later, the, the girl, the young daughter, you know, became more at ease. And in an interview, they asked, when was the, what was it that made it so when you looked at your mum that you realized, yeah, this is my mum? And the girl said they were at the, at the table doing some coloring sort of project. And she looked up into her mum's eyes and connected. And then it was like, yeah, this is mum. <laughs> So the woman later wrote a, a book uh, and it, the book was titled or subtitled Mothers, the most important thing to teach your daughters is that they are not their bodies. This is her takeaway from this, this experience. 
You know, it's, it's so easy for us to be caught up in the shallow things, the externals. And it's quite difficult to cultivate the vision to see people, the actual spiritual being, the person, the spiritual person within the body, and to relate to all beings, regardless of what the body looks like, its size, shape, color, anything. But to see that we have we have a com- there is a common reality. We are all eternally bound as like spiritual brothers and sisters. But we become separated by overemphasis on the, the outer garment, on the, the covering. So uh, sp- spiritual cultivation, cultivating a spiritual way of seeing things and of living, it really means that there's going to be a growth in, in appreciating one's own spiritual identity and the spiritual identity of all other living beings. When we can do this, it really begins to transform our social interactions, the way that we look at ourselves, the way we look at others, the way that we look at the world. And when a person chooses this course, and cultivates this type of vision and understanding, then their life is a life of wonderful balance and tremendous resilience. The capacity to withstand all the different storms that come. You know, people can be so shitty to each other say the most horrible things and to be so cruel. And it's so unnecessary. And it's always because there is no spiritual vision at all. There is no seeing another person residing within that body who is my brother or my sister that I'm actually connected to. In one of the, uh, we draw our knowledge and wisdom from a vast resource. It's called the Vedas. Veda actually means knowledge. And there are so many different books and texts within this vast collection. I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts from some verses from just one of these. Um, It's called the Bhagavad Gita. And here it's describing what spiritual growth means. That, and, and once again, just for clarity, spiritual growth means that I increasingly come to appreciate and connect with my deep spiritual identity, who I truly am. When a person grows this way, says, describing such a spiritually developed person, they will be one who is equipoised in honor and dishonor. That's just like amazing because we're so affected by the idea of somebody praising or honoring us. We get all elated. And then if someone says something bad about us and we hear it from somebody else, because usually people won't do it straight to your face, then it's kind of like you're all depressed and you're all... And we're talking about attaining a condition where both in honor and dishonor, it's you, you are equipoised. 
you are not influenced. You are, you are not um, thrown out of balance. Then also describing in another verse the nature of a person who has advancing spiritually a characteristic. There is even-mindedness, even-mindedness amid pleasant and unpleasant events. So it's not, it's not that you um, lose the recognition that some things are pleasurable or pleasant and other things are actually unpleasant and not pleasurable. But we don't become swept away by this. This doesn't control our life. We have a bigger vision. We have a deeper purpose and meaning in life. And finally, in another one, one who is wise and holds praise and blame to be the same, who is unchanged in honor and dishonor, who treats friends and foe alike. Such a person is considered to be very saintly, to be really established in spiritual understanding. And this is what we need to strive for. You've you've heard of the serenity prayer. I mentioned it last time we were here. It's it's absolutely amazing when you look at it from from a very spiritual perspective. It goes, grant me the serenity to accept those things I cannot change. The courage to change those things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. You will find that in life, most of us have an unfortunate tendency of wanting to change those things we cannot. How somebody spoke to you, what they said to you, how they treated you, you can't change that. Give up on thinking you can change it. Let it go. That's their problem, not your problem. Why do you take it to heart? You don't have to. Grant me the courage to change those things that I can. Your territory is this. You, the body that you have in your mind. This is your territory. This is what you need to work on. You don't need to work on what, how somebody else is addressing you. Unless it's one of your kids. You have a responsibility to teach them good manners and proper conduct. But if it's not your kid... If it's not a close relative, you don't have any business, even a close relative. You can't change them. That's not your business. Your business is how you are going to take things and how you are going to respond, how you are going to react. This is your area of responsibility. Somebody may say, well, I, I've got a, I'm suffering from severe... I don't know, anxiety, I've got all kinds of problems, social problems, I've got mental health issues, you know, and and, and I just can't deal with it. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something that's just like really amazing. You need to cultivate an understanding that the mind and the body is like your car. You are the driver of that car. Some people have really flash cars and other people have really crappy beat up cars. It's okay. The car is from getting to from A to B. That's what the car is for. Sometimes, you know, you've got something you need to go to Narawahia, or you're going to go up to Auckland or something, and it's kind of like once you get up to 45, the wheels start vibrating, and the car's shaking, so I've got to slow down to 42, you know, and everybody's tooting their horn and trying to get past me. It's okay. Don't worry. 
That's all you got to deal with for now. It's better than walking. Just, you know, okay, just settle down. Just drive it from A to B and then do what you need to do. This is part of learning to accept that which I cannot change. I cannot instantly change my thinking. You know, I need to go through some process to do that. But if my car is kind of all beat up and it smokes and it wobbles and the window keeps falling down, you know, and I got to tape it up or whatever, it's okay. Don't worry. Just use it. Use it the best way that you can. But all the drivers are the same. We, are, we, have, we share a common bond. And I need to cultivate an awareness of this so that I appreciate others, but I also appreciate the reality that, that as an eternal spiritual being, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't have to change. My car could use some <laughs> fixing up and changing or improving, but I don't. The actual person residing within. My, one of my teachers, he um, said something in relation to the goal of, of mindfulness type meditations. He said the ultimate goal of mindfulness meditation techniques is to realize that you are not the mind. Such realization allows you to passively and without judgment observe the content of your own mind. Creating distance between you, the observer, and your thoughts and feelings can keep you from being overwhelmed by either positive or negative emotions and feelings, thus providing you with inner peace, clarity, and insight. So you have more power than you think. You can actually take charge of your life. You can begin to make good decisions that produce really good outcomes. It is good to cultivate some understanding and knowledge how to do that. But the single thing that will be more effective at bringing change than anything else is to engage in this form of meditation to become absorbed even for a few minutes in this spiritual experience, the experience of the spiritual sound. It's just like, you know, you go up to the lake. I don't know if you want to go up to the lake. It's <laughs> You've got all these ducks up there, but you know, and you on a hot day and you want to immerse yourself, say, in, in the ocean or in a stream, you know, or even the shower. You've been all hot and sweaty doing some work. You stand in that water and feel refreshed and cleansed. This is the meaning of meditation to become immersed in that which is spiritual or transcendental. And it will have an effect. Even if you don't believe it, you don't have to study anything. Just by doing it, it will gradually transform your life. You will increasingly come to have this understanding of your true spiritual identity. You will begin to see yourself differently, the world differently, and others differently. You will become really solid in your life. You will become unshakable, even in the face of great sadness. One can experience tremendous sadness, but it doesn't knock you off balance. It doesn't crush you because there is a deeper spiritual understanding of things. Okay, that's all.
good enough or not? Or you want a refund? <laughs> you have to talk to James. So what, what we'll do is I'll just lead an, another kirtan. Then I understand after that there's a little supper or something. Yeah. And if you would like, during that time, you want to ask some questions, um, please feel free. It's so important to question. There's no dumb questions or questions, you know, that you may have about your spiritual growth are important. So don't be shy if you have something that you want to hear about. You may not even have a specific question. You may kind of have an idea. Can you talk about that? And that that's fine. I am very happy to share the, the wonderful things that I have been given. Thank you very much. So um, I'll probably chant the same two mantras that Kunti did, the Haribol Nithai Gaur, and maybe the, the Maha Mantra, the Hare Krishna Mantra. So I'll, I'll chant the mantra twice.
Thank you very much.